Welcome to Lecture 4 for BIB 202 Bible Doctrines 2. This lecture will be the third and final part of our study of Christology. Let's pick up where we left off in our last lecture underneath the section of the various views concerning Christ's death and atonement. Letter F. The biblical view is known as the orthodox view. Number one. This view teaches that Jesus' death was a substitution. This answers the question, how could a just God deal with sinners as they deserved and yet still deliver them from the punishment of their sins? Letter A. This means that Jesus died in our place and instead of us. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says that we have all gone astray and turned from our own way, but the iniquity that we have made was placed on Jesus. And in Romans chapter 5 verse 18, Jesus died for our benefit instead of us. In letter B, this is often called the vicarious death of Christ. A vicar is a substitute, or one who takes the place of another and acts in his or her stead. Jesus died not for his own sin, but for the sins of others. Therefore, since Christ died for our sins, we need not die for them if we accept him and his sacrifice. Letter C. There are two primary examples of substitution seen in the scriptures. The first is in Genesis 22, verse 13. Here we see that the ram was offered instead of Isaac. After Abraham placed his own son on the altar and was about to offer him as a sacrifice to be obedient to the Lord, the Lord stopped him and showed him that he had provided a ram to take the place of his son, Isaac. And secondly, in Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb was used as a substitute for the firstborn. Instead of the firstborn in every home having to die, if a lamb was killed and its blood placed on the door, then when the Lord went through Egypt, he would pass over those homes and spare them. But not only was Jesus' death a substitute, secondly, his death was a ransom or a redemption. Letter A. A ransom is the price that is paid to redeem something or someone. The word redeem or ransom in the New Testament is lutrao, which means to redeem, to ransom, to deliver, or to liberate. And secondly, the person who pays the price is known as the Redeemer. And of course, in this case, our Redeemer is Jesus Christ himself. And letter C this means Jesus bought us with his blood so that we could be free from sin and free to serve him. In Galatians 3.13, Paul says that we are bought out of the market from the curse of the law. 1 Peter 1 verse 18, Peter says that we were set free by paying a price of Jesus' blood. And in Revelation 5 verse 9, John says that we were bought in the market by the blood of Christ. Man was taken captive by sin, and a price is necessary to redeem him. But God in his love provided his only begotten son as that ransom. This means that Jesus paid the ransom that we who were captives might be set free. But then that begs the question, to whom was the ransom paid? Some believe the ransom was paid to Satan. To that I would say, ridiculous. 
A theologian by the name of Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, held to this view. If it is true, then this would require God to make a covenant with Satan. Deliverance from Satan has to do with sanctification, not redemption. So then, to whom was it paid? It was obviously paid to God himself. The great theologian Shedd said, God's mercy ransoms man from God's justice. Therefore, the love of God provides what his holiness demanded. When Jesus died, he paid the ransom to the Father. Thirdly, not only was Jesus our substitute and our redeemer, he is also our propitiation. Letter A. Propitiate means to appease or to pacify. This means that Jesus satisfied the justice and holiness of God so that God's wrath no longer abides on the one that has believed on Christ. According to Romans chapter 3 verse 25, this propitiation comes through belief in in Christ. And in 1 John 2 verse 2, Jesus' death also propitiated the world, but is only applied through faith in him. And in 1 John 4 10, this propitiation demonstrated the love of God. Fourthly and lastly, Jesus was not just our substitute, our ransom redeemer, and our propitiate, he is also our reconciliation. Now this deals with a change of relationship between hostile partners. In this context, it would be between God and mankind. So letter B, this means that Jesus broke down the barrier between God and man through his death and shed blood on the cross so that man can be saved and minister salvation to others. Romans 5 verse 10 tells us the death of Christ removed the barrier of sin. And in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 and 19, the death of Christ allows us to be saved, but also gives us the ministry of reconciliation. And then finally, in Colossians 1 verse 20, the blood of Christ is said to have reconciled us to himself. Again, further support that the payment of Christ to God was made and not to Satan. This reconciliation between God and man is due to God being propitiated by Jesus' death on the cross. Roman numeral three. Let's discuss the deaths Christ died. The first death Christ experienced was a physical death. Physical death is when the body is separated from the soul and the spirit. Jesus experienced this while dying on the cross. Secondly, Jesus' death was judicial. This means that he died to pay the penalty of the law. Thirdly, his death was intensive. He was able to suffer for all the sins of the entire world. Fourthly, Jesus' death was spiritual. His spiritual death was the separation he experienced from God. And fifthly and lastly, Jesus' death was eternal. Admittedly, the eternal death Christ experienced is an extension of the spiritual death. The Bible teaches that when an unbeliever dies, they experience the second death, or the eternal death, eternal separation from God. So for a finite creature, they will die for eternity to experience that eternal death. But when Christ was involved, he was an infinite man, an infinite creature, who died for a moment. So an infinite person dying for a moment is still considered mathematically an eternal death. 
This helps explain how Christ's death was a once and for all sacrifice, while the sacrifice of animals was only for that period of time. The animals were finite. Christ is infinite. Therefore, his one-time offering encompasses all of eternity. Roman numeral four. Now that we've talked about the deaths Christ died, let's look at the effects of Christ's death. Letter A. The first thing that Christ's death did was redeem the universe. Secondly, according to Galatians 3 and 1 Peter 1, Christ's death redeemed mankind or offered the opportunity for mankind to be redeemed. And thirdly and lastly, Christ's death judged Satan. In Colossians chapter 2, it talks about the principalities and powers, which are the demonic forces that are judged by Christ on the cross. In Roman numeral 5, let's look at the extent of Christ's death. This is going to answer the question, did Christ die for the individual? Did he die for the sinner? Did he die for just the elect, the church, or did he die for everyone? And the answer to that question is yes. First, Christ died for the ungodly, according to Romans 5, 6, the sinful, according to 1 Timothy 1, 15, and the unjust, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But also, Christ died for the church and the elect. According to Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, Christ loved and died for the church. Therefore, husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ did for the church. And then 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, Jesus is said to be the Savior of all, but especially to those who are believers. Thirdly, Christ also died for the individual. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says that Jesus tasted death for every man, meaning every individual. And fourthly and lastly, Christ died for everyone. John chapter 1 verse 29 said that Jesus lights everyone who comes into the world. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says that Jesus was the ransom for all. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it declares that Jesus was the propitiation for those whom John was writing and, he says, for the entire world. Now let's look at Roman numeral 6, the resurrection of Jesus. Let's begin by discussing the nature of Jesus' resurrected body. There are three things we need to point out about his resurrected body. First is that it was somewhat different from his former body. We can see this by the fact that most individuals did not recognize Jesus right away when they saw him in his post-resurrection body. Secondly, it was also somewhat similar to his former body. We say that because when people did realize it was him, it was a like a light bulb going off in their head and they re remembered who he was and he looked slightly similar to how he did before. And thirdly and lastly, it was not hindered by nature. This can be seen in the fact that Jesus was able to appear to the disciples in the middle of a room and when Jesus ascended to heaven. Now, him ascending to heaven is another word for Jesus flew. So obviously his body was not hindered by nature after his resurrection like it was sort of before. And before we get into the topics such as the evidences for the resurrection, let's first discuss the false theories explaining the resurrection. The first false theory is known as the hallucination theory. This theory states that the disciples only saw what they thought was Jesus because they were hallucinating out of their grief and woe. There are two primary evidences we can use to refute this. First, how did groups of people all see or hallucinate the same thing at the same time? 
And secondly, how did groups of people all see or hallucinate the same thing at different times? The second false theory is known as the wrong tomb theory. This theory believes that the witnesses went to the wrong tomb. The first of two main points of refutation for this is that women watched them put the body into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And secondly, then why did the religious leaders not just take the people to the correct or the right tomb and show them the body of Jesus? The third false theory is known as the swoon theory. This theory declares that Jesus did not die but merely fainted on the cross, and he revived in the tomb. Our two points of refutation are number one, the soldiers announced his death and pierced his side. And secondly, how could man, so physically punished, be able to roll a stone away and convince people that he was alive and well? The fourth and final false theory that we'll discuss in this course is known as the pagan borrowing theory. This theory states that the disciples copied other pagan myths about resurrection and death and changed the events to match what they wanted others to know about Jesus. Our first point to refute this false theory is the question, what about the evidence of the resurrection, which we'll talk about in just a second. And secondly, how or why were the disciples willing to die for a myth? Or let me phrase it this way. How or why were the disciples willing to die for a lie they made up? Surely, a couple of them, if it was a lie, would have been willing to die for it. But not everyone, and especially not to the extent of how many of them were murdered. So now that I've mentioned them, let's discuss the evidences of the resurrection. There are four primary evidences to support the resurrection of Jesus. The first is the bodiless tomb. Second are the grave clothes. Third are the many appearances to different people at different times and in different places. And fourthly and lastly, the fearless disciples. Letter D. Who were the initiators of the resurrection of Christ? Well, first, Jesus was active in his own resurrection. We can see this in John chapter 10, verse 18, where it says, No man takes it from me, talking about his life, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now, this definitively shows that Jesus knew what was going to happen to him and how he was going to be able to bring himself back from the dead. But not only was Jesus an active agent of the resurrection, so was God the Father. In Acts chapter 2, it says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And thirdly and lastly, you may have guessed it, the Holy Spirit was active in Jesus' resurrection. Romans 8 verse 11 says, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. All three persons of the Godhead were active in the resurrection of Christ. And finally, letter E. Let's discuss the importance of the resurrection. The first thing that I want to point out is that the resurrection confirmed Jesus' divine sonship. Romans 8 verse 11 says, And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By his resurrection. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. That claim was substantiated not by his death, but by him doing what no one else had done, 
coming back from the dead, and living forever. Secondly, Jesus' resurrection also makes our salvation real and meaningful. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul discusses the resurrection of Christ and completely ties it into us. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he, if he did not raise, then none will be raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Then he continues, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ, they've just perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all of people most to be pitied. Now, Paul is not saying any of this to be necessarily true. He's saying in a hypothetical that we know Christ raised from the was raised from the dead, so that gives us the hope that our salvation is real and it has meaning to it. Thirdly, Christ's resurrection also gives us a living hope. According to 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Fourthly, Christ's resurrection guarantees the resurrection of all mankind. Returning back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, talking about Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Number five. Jesus' resurrection gives us the prototype for our resurrected body. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Sixthly, Christ's resurrection gives us daily victory over sin. Paul stated that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And lastly, the resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection and judgment of the unsaved. According to John in chapter 5, the Lord said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, but those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And finally, Roman numeral 7, the last topic in our study of Christology is the ascension of Christ. Let's start off by discussing the importance of the ascension of Christ. Number one, it marked the end of Jesus' earthly mission. Secondly, it provides the way for the Spirit to come and begin his ministry of indwelling believers. John chapter 16 verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, obviously Jesus speaking here, for if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When Jesus ascended to heaven, not only did that mark the end of Jesus' earthly mission or ministry, it provided a way for the Spirit to begin his ministry of indwelling every believer. And thirdly, it marks the beginning of the earthly mission of God's people. 
Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now that we've discussed the importance of the ascension of Christ, let's look at letter B. Jesus' ascension enthroned him at the right hand of the Father. According to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. This denotes a prominent position, being at the right hand. But it deals with Jesus as man and not God, since sitting is physical and the Father is a spirit. In letter C, Jesus' ascension allowed him to become the head of the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, which we will discuss later when we get to the topic of ecclesiology, Paul says that when Christ ascended to heaven, he was made the head of the church. We have one head. That head is Jesus. We are his body. And finally, Jesus' ascension foreshadows Christ's second advent. This foreshadowing is seen in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, when the angels spoke to the disciples and said the same way Jesus left, he will one day return. And that brings us to the end of our discussion of Christology and the end of Lecture 4 for BIB 202 Bible Doctrines 2.